Good day, everyone. Welcome to our program that explores and discusses discoveries and new knowledge in our midst. The new discovery featured today is a genus of species of shipworms that was found in the waters of Mabini, Batangas, located 128 kilometers south of Manila. It was named Tamilocus mabinia. The scientist who discovered it chose Tamilocus as the genus name based on the local name of shipworms, which is Tamiloc. Traditionally, the species name can be based on the locality where it was found, and in this case, in Mabini, or it could be named after an important person, in this case, in honor of our national hero, Apollinario Mabini. Shipworms are wood-eating bivalves from that family, Teredinae, and finding a new genus is very rare. Tamilocus is the only second new genus described in this family for almost 100 years. As pointed out by Dr. Ruben Shipway, a postdoctoral research scientist at the Ocean Genome Legacy of Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts, USA, and part of the Philippine Mollus Symbiont International Cooperative Biodiversity Group, this is the second new shipworm genus described since Zachisa, in 1933. Shipworms as a whole have a wide ranging economic and ecological impacts in coastal marine systems. So here to tell us more about this exciting discovery is the head of the Marine Natural Products Laboratory at the University of the Philippines Marine Science Institute and an acad academician of the National Academy of Science and Technology and former vice president for academic affairs of the University of the Philippine System. She and her team have been studying Tamiloc since 2009 under the program funded by the United States National Institutes of Health, the Fogarty International, the U.S. National Science Foundation, and the U.S. Department of Energy. She will share with us and expound further about Tamilocus mabinia. So let us welcome Dr. Gisela P. Concepcion, or Giselle, as she is known to many. Hello, Ben. Thanks for that nice introduction. Indeed, it is a pleasure and a privilege to have this discussion with you about the Tamilocus mabinia. Giselle, can you tell us about your involvement with the Philippine Mollus Symbiont International Cooperative Biodiversity Group? Ben, I am the Associate Program Leader of the Philippine team of the Philippine Mollusk Symbiont International Cooperative Biodiversity Group, or PMS-ICBG for short. We are based at the UP Diliman Marine Science Institute, or MSI. Working with me are younger scientists in UP, like Lilibeth Salvador Reyes of MSI, and Aaron Villaraza of the Institute of Chemistry. Our team consists of many young graduate students and researchers who work in our labs and are also given the opportunity to train intensively in the labs of our foreign collaborators. Among my researchers from MSI, there is one that I'd like to mention, uh, Marvin Altamia, who has devoted his life to studying shipworms. Marvin works exceptionally well with my foreign collaborators, and he is a co-author of our paper. So can you describe what the PMS-ICBG is? PMS-ICBG has four major goals. First, to pursue basic research on Philippine mollusk biodiversity and mollusk microbe symbiosis because we have a mega diversity of mollusks in our country. Second, to discover bioactive compounds as potential drugs from the microbes associated with the mollusks for various conditions, for pain, aging, infections, and cancer. Third, to provide scientific training and capacity building in the Philippines. And fourth, to foster conservation of bioresources in the Philippines. PMS-ICBG is a consortium or collaboration of one Philippine academic institution, that's MSI, and five U.S. academic institutions, the University of Utah, the Acad Academy of Natural Sciences of Philadelphia, 
which is part of Drexel University. The Ocean Genome Legacy in Northeastern University and the Oregon Health and Science University. Our principal investigator, or PI, is Margot Haygood of Utah, known for her expertise on marine microbiology and symbionts. Aside from Margot, scientists involved in this particular discovery are the world's expert on shipworms, Dan Distel of OGL, the world's expert on molluscan taxonomy, Gary Rosenberg of ANSP, and others in our group are the renowned Philippine biochemist Baldomero Toto Oliveira and the natural products chemist Eric Schmidt, both from the University of Utah, with whom we are discovering new bioactive compounds. I understand that you are one of the writers of the research paper about this new discovery. Can you share us the purpose of the paper? In this paper, to be published in the journal PRJ in the next few days, we are describing a newly discovered genus and species of a clam or bivalve that we found in sunken driftwood in the waters of Balayan Bay off the coast of Mabini in Batangas. Could you tell us what shipworms are? Where in the Philippines are they usually found? Could you also tell us why you're interested in studying and describing shipworms and why people should be interested in this research about shipworms? Shipworms look like worms, but they are not worms. They are clams or bivalves, a kind of mollusk, just like oysters and mussels. They bore holes on ships and thus their name shipworms. They burrow on wood. They are known as the termites or anai of the sea. In the Philippines, local folk call them tamilok. And so we chose the name Tamilocus mabinia for this new shipworm that we found in Mabini, Batangas. Tamilok is known as an exotic food or delicacy in many parts of our country, like Palawan, Quezon, the Visayas, and Mindanao. Once, we documented the kinds of Tamilok recipes prepared in homes and restaurants in Infanta, Quezon, from kilawin to uh, cook dishes. As you might recall that in early 2017, our PMS ICBG group made a big international splash when we published our studies in uh, PINAS, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, on the biggest, longest shipworm in the world known as Cufus polythalamia. And some said it was monstrous. Kufus had been known to exist for centuries, but was never seen alive until now. Kufus was found in a sulfidic muddy lake in Sultan Kudarat in Mindanao. Aside from our other interesting findings about Kufus, including its uh, bacterial symbiont, Kufus is also a food delicacy eaten by the local folk and Nutritional, medicinal, and aphrodisiac properties are being attributed to Kufus. However, these claims would require further scientific investigation. But aside from their food value, we are interested in shipworms because they are interesting, unique organisms with ecological and economic importance. They are wood borrowing and wood-eating animals. They are able to break down the cellulose in wood into glucose as a source of food and energy. And that is because they have associated bacteria in their gills, which produce a suite of enzymes called cellulases. By processing wood debris, they release food and energy stored in submerged wood and driftwood, and thus they play a fundamental role in carbon recycling and transferring terrestrial energy from wood to the wider marine environment. 
This tunneling effect creates niches for other small organisms to grow and thrive. And so they are ecologically important. Being able to modify shallow marine and brackish environments, and they have significant impacts on the biodiversity of a coastal marine ecosystem. Shipworms are economically important. They can be destructive to any unprotected and untreated wooden constructions submerged in marine water, such as wooden ships, harbor buildings, and uh, piles, piers, jetties, wharves, fishing equipment, and even aquaculture pens. And this is estimated to cause damage and losses all over the world worth billions of dollars. As an example of great economic impact, we can tell you how shipworms helped turn the tide of history. It is said that the Spanish Armada fleet was defeated by the British Empire fleet centuries ago because the Spanish ships were infested with shipworms. And so they sank easily. Because of their ecological and economic importance, I think the discovery of Familocus mabinia is an exciting development in the field of marine science. Shipworms can be explored for industrial uses. There are few animals that can break down cellulose in wood as efficiently as shipworms and termites. The cellulases they produce can be used for waste recycling, biomaterials, processing, and the biofuel industry, such as uh, bioethanol production, okay, which relies on glucose. And there is another reason we are studying shipworms, and it is related to our other goal in our research program, which is to discover new bioactive compounds produced by the bacteria associated with mollusks. It turns out that the bacteria found in the gills of the shipworms, aside from producing cellulases, also produce bioactive organic small molecules that we could explore as treatment for infections, cancer, pain, and neurodegenerative conditions associated with aging. And so we are excited about this discovery because every new genus and species of shipworm with its own unique biology, would likely have its own unique bacterial community. And um, this could provide us new sources of new compounds to develop as drugs. Bottom line, Benji, is um, it is truly fascinating to discover a new genus and species, as you know. To see a product of nature and evolution that one has never seen before. This is telling us, indeed, the Philippines is the center of marine mollusk biodiversity in the world, as it is the center of all marine biodiversity in the world, and don't we know it? Yes, those are very interesting insights. But can you share us with some findings of your study and also discuss aspects of the methods that you use? Uh, I believe some of them are very technological. As a um, biodiversity and biogeography uh, scientist, Benji, you know that taxonomy is um, how we study our biodiversity and evolution. And so our approach here is what we call integrative taxonomy. So when we were young and growing up, we uh, knew about classical taxonomy that's based on morphology. So especially for, for mollusks, it's so easy to um, distinguish them based on their shell morphology. Okay. But nowadays, that's not enough. And so we resort to other high-value taxonomic characters aside from morphological features. We want to look at anatomical features, and we also want to look at their genetics or we look at their phylogenetics. So uh, these are now uh, the ways we identify uh, genera, genus, and species for all 
classes of organisms, whether plant, animal, or microbial. But in particular, the, um, the shipworms are very challenging and therefore interesting uh, in terms of taxonomy because, for one, they have what you call degenerate shells or calcareous parts. And in fact, uh, the shipworms are um, soft-budded and they have a huge uh, visceral mass that kind of clouds their different uh, organs and anatomic parts. And so, um, well, actually, um, there are like 16 genera so far. And so this is like the 17th after how many decades now or almost 100 years. And let me say that this is where technology uh, that um, involves um, high resolution instrumentation helps us even in documenting and conserving our biodiversity. So in this paper, uh, we report for the first time the use of what we call micro CT. You're familiar with that, yes. Ben, yes. because it's already reported in the literature. It stands for micro uh, computed tomography. So um, in hospitals, we know that uh, we uh, have um, an ailment that we want diagnosed or we want to have an executive checkup. And uh, oftentimes we are asked to have an MRI. Okay, or a CT scan. Okay, so this is something very similar. So it's the same principle. And it uh, relies on very uh, powerful instrumentation. And the instruments get better and better in terms of the resolution. And what's been done here is to make use of a micro, not just a mini, but a micro CT scan. Okay, that's suitable for the size of uh, the uh, tamilocus or shipworms. In this case, the shipworm is centimeters long, right? And um, by taking photos or images of uh, the organism of the shipworm in any direction or in any plane that you wish, you're able to build a 3D virtual model of the organism. And that's so important. Why? Because well, we only had nine specimens that we collected from um, Mabini. This is in Balayan Bay. So Mabini is a coastal town um, of Balayan Bay. Okay, let me backtrack about what else is important in terms of the method. So we got the specimen and we are able to have a photograph of it, an accurate one. And we don't have to sacrifice or dissect or destroy so many of the specimens. We choose the best ones or even the partial specimens and do the imaging. But we uh, reserve the best specimen as the holotype. And then we have some paratypes. And we are depositing these in reputable museums in the world including the Philippine National Museum when it's ready um, after renovation. And we also have one at the Marine Science Institute. But then let me backtrack to the critical sample collection part of the methods. And for that, first of all, our government requires that we um, get permits from them. So my group is an expert in getting the right permits for biodiversity studies. And it's not just one kind of permit, it's several permits, prior informed consent of the local community, the gratuitous permit from the DAB FAR, and then we have an MOU with them, and we have to renew this every year. So we have all of those in place. And then uh, we have our team of our graduate students researchers and led by us and our foreign collaborators who go to the field and set, set up a bio lab. And we bring all our uh, equipment, uh, storage facilities, um, aquarium tanks, as well as our microscopes, our dissecting tools, as well as our hammers to the field. So now let me tell you how um, this particular tamilocus was uh, collected. So uh, our researchers went uh, diving and snorkeling and um, then um, they just went to about two meters deep or even less. And they were uh, specifically looking for 
logs, big logs, and they found a, a two-meter one. But it was a log that had been damaged, so that was their cue that uh, the log was not like you know intact. It had like holes, or obviously uh, some animals had been burrowing on the wood. So when they found that, then they brought it up and uh, brought it to our lab near the shore, and then oh started hammering at the wood, because there are cues or hints that there are. Uh, you know, shipworms uh, living inside. And sure enough, with the uh, hammers um, and lots of, um, you know, uh, things that can break up wood, they're able to find live animals there. And uh, they carefully extracted uh, the uh, tamilocus from the burrows and then um, uh, prepared them for documentation and for preservation. So, uh, you know, we're complete with our uh, good digital uh, microscopes and cameras uh, in the labs. And then, of course, we had to uh, make decision of what's going for um, uh, formalin preservation. But then um, you, you want to be able to um, uh, preserve it properly, so the final medium is not formalin, it's ethanol, 70% ethanol. You know that, right? But then there's another part that we need to uh, uh, do, and that is the genetics. So, you know, we have to uh, get some material uh, fresh to get the DNA extracted properly and um, preserved, and that's, you know, 100% ethanol. And then afterwards, all the, um, you know, uh, the um, uh, imaging, uh, could be done properly, okay? Because we um, pre prepared and preserved our whole specimens correctly. For the genetics, we did the, the standard one. Uh, so the DNA barcoding is either CL1 or in some cases it would be, if it's bacterial 16S, this one it is the uh, small 18S subunit and the large 28S subunit of our RNA genes, okay? And um, then we concatenated the sequences and compared it with uh, the sequences that's out there in uh, GenBank, okay? Now, what else is involved? Because uh, this is an identification, definitive identification project. Then uh, let's um, see how we um, are able to contrast and compare uh, this particular shipworm, which already, you know, said, hey, this looks like, at the very least, a new genus. But it could be a new, no, at the very least, a new species. But it could very well be a new genus, okay, because of uh, some unique, unique um, properties of the palettes. It was pinkish and it was pinstriped. So they never saw that, never saw that before, okay. So then we had to get samples of other genera of shipworms from a reputable museum. So we got it from the Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology. And we know the famous genera are from the time that Ruth Turner uh, studied them. We have our Bankia, we have our Dysiatifer, we have our Bactrinophorus, and we also have those in the Philippines. Okay, and then of course we have the Kufus and others which are more closely related to this like you, unique or weird looking shipworm that we had never seen before. So in the paper you will see in a table that the comparison of uh, this um, uh, Tamilocus is with genera uh, that are probably most closely uh, related to it in the phylogenetic tree. So this is what you call integrative taxonomy. You try to look at the genetics, you try to look at the uh, morphological and the um, anatomic features. Okay? What this um, revolutionary um, technology, micro CT, is able to do for us is to be able to uh, just use small material to come up with a genus identification. 
leaving us enough specimens to deposit in uh, the museums, the reputable museums of the world. I think that's very, very important. Uh, what this uh, micro CT technology is uh, able to do is to be able to compare accurately uh, the morphological and anatomic features of Tamilocus with the uh, other genera. So you can imagine those would also be subjected to the same micro uh, CT uh, analysis and 3D uh, imaging. Okay, so I could go on and on, <laughs> but I think, <laughs> oh yeah, that's. Um, yeah. Well, uh, as we can see, the technology to to do these uh, species identifications have advanced because before it was just histology and electron microscopy. Now we're using uh, micro CT. Your study is really quite unique, uh, especially for a group of uh, mollusks that are hardly ever known by a lot of people. And it's indeed a great contribution to the discourse and knowledge about our mollusks here in the Philippines. And I'm quite sure that you experienced some challenges while doing this. But I think you shared with us the challenges you met in doing this study and research. Perhaps you can add more? <laughs> well, I think that the um, first challenge is always access to uh, the biodiversity. And it takes us years <laughs> to get our permits and oh, to get the our legal, type. <laughs> real legal yeah, type. But legal still, type. we succeed because we're persistent and tenacious about it. And um, we appreciate the DAB FAR for allowing us to, um, uh, you know, to um, study organisms in the Verde Island Passage, where Mabini Batangas is. Okay, maybe the second challenge is, um, um, well, it's, it's still in line with my, um, you know, uh, perpetual advocacy, which is um, uh, maybe the limited number of experts in our country. So here we say that um, we have um, foreign experts and we are um, lucky to have them with us. Uh, and they're very um, um, protective of our biodiversity as well. But more than that, I think um, they are committed to training us and the next generation of biodiversity researchers in the world. And so, um, uh, I would say that the challenges are being met by our uh, program and um, our um, graduate students and researchers, oh, they um, complete their uh, master's degrees. It's not without difficulty, but then and afterwards they proceed to their PhDs, but immediately they already know the wealth of biodiversity in this country. So are you saying that uh, they will not come home for good? I doubt it. I think they, they, there's an advantage of um, uh, eventually being here where uh, the action is, where you are closest to the bi biodiversity. Indeed, there are uh, challenges because you're thinking now, Benji, that um, we might have a micro CT in your lab or my lab eventually to uh, uh, try to um, identify new genus and species. Again, um, do we have the uh, funds for equipment to purchase those? Do we have, uh, again, the technical expertise to run them well and to um, uh, maintain and repair them? So it's still the fundamental um, problems that we face in R&D in the university. But what's nice is you have hospitals that you know, know the principles of, uh, you know, the CT scan and the MRI. And this is just um, like made micro smaller, okay? Um, it applies also to animal studies or animal models like mice. And we wish that we already had an MRI suited for a mouse, right? But this one is micro. This is for <laughs> the Tamilox. I think that um, it's exciting. Uh, oh, while it is challenging, yeah. So as you yourself has shared earlier, the shipworms have both ecological and economic importance to our lives and to our culture. So what impact would you like your research or study to have? Okay, so um, in this paper we reported only one kind of shipworm, and it's one that's submerged uh, 
uh, two meters or less in a log is submerged. Wood is submerged. Okay, they have um, uh, slightly different habitats depending on the uh, genus, and uh, you know we have a um, program proposal that uh, MSI will uh, submit, perhaps to be card, um, and it's on uh, Bakawan. Mangroves. Mangroves, yeah. because um, other shipworms, they, they're really in uh, yeah. mangroves. Okay, mangrove wood, kakawati, driftwood. Okay, okay. Then there's, of course, the kufus, um, polythalamia. That's an entirely different habitat. It's uh, in a sulfidic muddy lake. Okay, so it's um, uh, uses would also be different. But um, going back to your um, question, I think uh, studying um, the basic science of um, uh, the Tamilox, whether in Bakawan or in um, submerged uh, logs, would be important for um, chemical oceanographers uh, and uh, environmental scientists. As we said earlier, they are a major player in carbon recycling from uh, terrestrial yeah, sources, wood. Just to rush back to the marine environment where we came from, anyway, all of us. But uh, aside from that, um, as I said, we're um, very eager to know about the microbial symbionts of this Tamilocus. And uh, we're hoping that uh, we can also discover a new uh, genera genus of uh, the bacteria, as we did for the Kufus and as we are doing for many more. So we're actually discovering so many um, new uh, uh, genera and species of micro and macro organisms. And not only that, we are discovering new compounds. And as a tribute to uh, Philippine biodiversity, we are naming uh, them after uh, Filipinos and uh, Filipino localities. For example, uh, you know, we have nicknamed our compounds, they're not yet published, but um, we have a boholamide, we have a butuanamide, we have a mindapirols for uh, compounds that were isolated from a microorganism found in Mindanao, okay, in the same tradition as uh, Toto Oliveira named Conantukin, Contulakin, Conikot Ikot. So, mm -hmm. you know, Filipino names, Apollinario, and finally, of course, we yeah. are paying tribute to Apollinario Mabini our national hero who is the learned. We find it important to name it after our uh, intellectual national hero, the sublime paralytic, Apollinario Mabini. I think that's very important um, because he is one of our national heroes who um, valued education, uh, knowledge, and learning. And I think that um, unless we um, you know, do these kinds of basic research to uh, extend and expand our understanding of uh, nature and evolution, uh, which is so rich in our country. I don't think we can uh, fascinate our uh, school children, our uh, undergraduates and postgraduates, try to um, contribute to our country's uh, growth and development in um, these uh, innovative ways. I think there are many uh, uh, reasons why we would like to uh, pursue this research. It's a bit um, on the um, basic side, and you'll say, hey, what's the economic importance of this? But I started out by saying that, um, you know, if we could think of the uh, health of the Bakawan or the mangrove ecosystem, and we already have identified a site, then that could be the site for a uh, community-based um, agro-industrial activities and um, sources of livelihood. And the shipworms would be a major player in maintaining the health of the mangrove, in providing uh, perhaps food, you know, as a delicacy, and providing us the uh, bacteria that are the source of new drugs, potential drugs. Well, uh, probably that's the main point that you'd like uh, people to understand. And if you have anything to add to, perhaps in the, for, for the person on the street, if they ask about the new discovery, uh, what would you like 
them to really understand about about it. Yeah, not only the person in the street, but uh, the the persons who are always out there in the water in uh, Anilao, you know, the the divers who do it for for fun or for pleasure. They should help us with our biological studies or ecological studies. So if uh, we publicize this kind of research, uh, who knows, there might be, um, you know, be able to spot new organisms, not just shipworms that had never been uh, uh, seen before. And that's quite likely. And the way that's being done now is, you know, there are sites where you uh, post an image of uh, the organism and then there's a way of uh, checking out whether that particular genus or spe species has already been identified. That's good learning for our uh, kids, our ch school children, and also for our adult population. And uh, this is uh, bringing science uh, one step closer to, um, to what you call citizen science, that kind of uh, science, yes. right? Yes, citizen science. <laughs> citizen science. And uh, it's nice because it's um, now um, featured by, um, by our um, ICT experts here in uh, UP, Film Institute and uh, MASCOM. And I think that for us to communicate this uh, well to our uh, general public, even to our government officials and science administrators. We need our artists, culture experts, and social scientists to communicate the medium, the short, the medium, and long-term benefits of this kind of research to uh, Filipinos. So would like to share any other thoughts or comments or maybe any last words about your study? Oh, uh, we'd like to encourage scientists in um, uh, UP, Diliman College of Science and other uh, CUs of UP uh, to be engaged in biodiversity research. I believe that um, the way to uh, sustain this kind of research is to make uh, the people uh, who are surrounded by the biodiversity involved. And the best way to do that and to sustain this, this effort is through the education system. So the uh, public school system, whether it is the grade school, sorry, the K to 12, and then all the way to the SUCs, they should be um, linking up with us. We should be reaching out to them. And uh, in this case, I already have the person in MSI whom I think uh, would serve as a bridge, say, to Batanga State University, okay, to continue this kind of research. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Concepcion, for sharing with us the, your, this very important, interesting discovery. This makes us proud that this genus species was found in the area of Mabini, Batangas in the Philippines. Thank you to Ben for inviting me to this program. To everyone, let us always look forward to new discoveries and new knowledge, especially by those involving Filipino scientists and academics. Thank you. And to our viewers, we would hope that you were able to learn so much about this new genus and species of shipworm, Tamilocus mabinia. We hope to see you again for another interesting and exciting new discovery. I am Dr. Ben Valiao Jr. bidding you goodbye.